Professor Yu, South Korea is the only hope at here. Now, do you have, um, you know, do you want to add any other kind of comments on the, the role of South Korea or the possibility of East Asian integration? At here? I want to completely agree with uh, Professor Lee. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, with, uh, 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 so with a little bit of a modification, yeah. So uh, I agree that uh, either China or Japan uh, will have great difficulty yeah, in exerting a leadership role in East Asia. That is uh, one of the reasons why you don't see that kind of uh, in regional integration you see from uh, Europe. So in, yeah, in East Asia, yeah, Japan, yeah, historical issue yeah, has not been resolved, and China yeah, has its own problems. Uh, so uh, there is a great role for, uh, great potential for Korea to uh, exert effective leadership role. But uh, it's effective leadership, but uh, Korea yeah, cannot claim we are the leader. Yeah? Especially, yeah? So uh, Korea may have to take leadership role effectively, not pretending to be a leader, but uh, more in a subtle way, as a kind of a, a media, mediator. I don't know if it is a good expression. Well, some, 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 something like that. Mm -hmm. And another thing is, right now, six, six party talks is a forum for, uh, to resolve the nuclear issue. Uh, but this forum, could has a potential to develop. Uh, uh, yeah, it's true. Uh, there is a statement, uh, six party talks is now uh, in, uh, uh, so uh, uh, ha, 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 has its own problem. Uh, and it's very difficult to solve North Korea and the Korean nuclearization, uh, denuclearization problem. But if it solves, nuclear issues, that it has a potential to develop into a more permanent security cooperation and regional integration mm -hmm. forum for, uh, for the region. Mm -hmm. So that also, yeah, could be an opportunity for Korea. Very good point, very good point. Now, Professor Pierda, I, I hope you're not disappointed since I changed the order at here, but, but <laughs> not at all. <laughs> Let me just ask you one question. Well, usually when you're talking about East Asian integration or East Asian regional cooperation, we always rely on to the European Union model, I think. Is there really anything that we can really learn from that model at here on East Asian? countries, the way that we can integrate it here? Um, it's a great question. Um, I, the truth of the matter is that the, the European integration has had a mixed history so far. Um, at one level, clearly incredibly successful in terms of its goal, which is to bring about more economic integration with a long-term hope of building political integration. However, you're already seeing the dangers of that. Um, by creating a single currency without a single government that could actually regulate that currency, you've actually de facto allowed one country to become de facto the economic hegemony of Europe. That's actually created tremendous resentment among some of the other countries. You're seeing actually, very chillingly, the rise of right-wing nationalistic movements now in Europe, which of course is precisely what <laughs> European integration was aimed at derailing, and now you're actually seeing it being propelled. And I don't mean to be horribly pessimistic, but let's simply say there is a danger that this could play out in exceedingly horrific ways. Mm -hmm. um, so that would be a good negative example. <laughs> <laughs> okay. so, could there therefore be a way of thinking about integration in a way that would not allow this sort of ironic <laughs> twist where you actually end up creating precisely the, the thing, that you're the phenomenon that you're trying to avoid? And I would very much agree here with Professor Lee and Professor Yu in terms of possibilities. Um, I think some kind of immediate economic, I mean, some kind of immediate uh, move toward a single currency I think would not be a wise idea. Clearly, that was a mistake, I think, um, in terms of how it was handled in Europe. Um, could you have a single power that would be a hegemonic force developing this? I think clearly no, and I think both the attempts by either China or Japan to do so would very understandably um, 
be responded to very negatively by the rest of East Asia. So could you, on the contrary, have a country like South Korea play, and I actually, I, I actually think it is a good word, a mediating role, um, to, to bring about some kind of integration that would not be the sort of, of forced integration that potentially is dangerous in the way it's been handled in Europe. Mm -hmm. And just adding an historical note, a note here, we often think about a traditional East Asia as being dominated by this incredibly powerful imperial China with the rest of East Asia simply being tributaries to it. The truth of the matter is that's been true only very rarely in East Asian history. That was true, say, of the Tang Dynasty, for example. Um, usually East Asian history in terms of international relations has involved largely been through networks with, frankly, largely egalitarian powers, and yes, Korea has played a crucial role in that precisely as a mediating power throughout East Asia, and as a mediating power that has not played into significant imperial concerns. And therefore, indeed, now it could play a similar role. Again, it, it is not viewed throughout East Asia as likely to play out any kind of imperial vision. Um, it could play in a kind of mediating role that could build a slowly but surely an integration role that would even perhaps bring North Korea into it over the long term and perhaps create the kind of integration that would not play into the rise of nationalism as at least mm -hmm. dangerously has played out in part in Europe. Yeah, thank you. Since we are talking about the role of South Korea as a mediating kind of player, it probably could be the new superpower, no, not exactly the superpower, but at least a rising power out here. Now, why don't we just change our topic to now South Korea? Since we talked about so much of the role of South Korea, why don't we talk about not exactly South Korea, about the North Korea's <laughs> nuclear ambition? And the, of course, it's kind of the response from the South too that we're gonna focus on, but why don't we just first focus on another fundamental question out here is, why is the North Korean government continuing to develop its nuclear program at this point? What do you think are the goals behind this policy? Well, as I mentioned before, during the past two weeks, how many attempts and how, how many, like, you know, the missiles or the projectiles that they actually shoot to the East Coast out there? Now, what is the major reading, what is the major reason of this? Professor Piet, can you start for us? Sure. I, I don't think this is at all coincidental. I, I think what is going on in North Korea, and particularly these recent provocative acts, are a direct and immediate response to precisely the issues we were mentioning earlier. Namely, as China, clearly very frustrated with North Korea, is looking elsewhere, primarily to South Korea, hoping to build relationships with South Korea, hoping to build a realignment in East Asia, which clearly would leave North Korea out. North Korea is responding by being a very isolated power that is trying to now become as provocative as it can. It is rebuilding its nuclear program as quickly as it can. It's firing these missiles. It is trying to not be the figure late sort of isolated from what's going on throughout the rest of East Asia. Now this is, to use your earlier very strong terminology, and when I agree with it, is both an opportunity and a threat. Um, clearly, by North Korea feeling very isolated, you're seeing the dangerous tendencies toward this. It is, it is pushing North Korea toward its most dangerous tendencies. Of course, the flip side of this in the long run is by isolating North Korea, by slowly creating, which I think it, with different points of view is shared by all other powers, an integrated order that would not support North Korea's policies you hopefully are moving toward a world where at least other voices in North Korea could have more strength and could push toward joining such an integration. And I think these next few years are going to be absolutely crucial. Are we going to see a more dangerous North Korea emerging as it's being isolated? Or will all of this help to encourage a more reasonable North Korea that will ultimately join in this larger integration? Needless to say, the latter is in everyone's best interests, and the goal now will be to build the kind of links with North Korea that will encourage that development, as opposed to creating a sense of isolation that will create a very dangerous situation. Sure. Now this time, why don't I ask you, Professor Yu, first. <laughs> um, Professor Yu, well, we just actually talked about the way that we can actually solve the, this, or, or the way that we look at the nuclear kind of testing it here. But, what is the ultimate goal at here? What are, where are they actually looking for at here? The North, North Korean region? region? Yes. It's simple. I think uh, it's for North Korea, there is a, uh, no other choice, actually. Mm -hmm. So uh, North Korea has been uh, threatened by uh, U.S. nuclear power. Uh, 
uh, which were uh, located in uh, South Korea in the past, and still U.S. provides a nuclear umbrella. And uh, South Korea alone is a big threat to North Korea's security. Mm -hmm. South Korea's economic power and military power is strong. And in this addition, the United States, uh, especially after the Iraq and uh, George Bush's uh, access of evil speech in North Korea's uh, the lesson North Korean regime reads from uh, the U.S. actions is Saddam Hussein. Uh, uh, because lack of nuclear weapons, uh, uh, the Iraq was uh, Hussein uh, was destroyed. So uh, for the security of the regime, uh, North Korea uh, will find the nuclear option as cheapest and the most effective way to defend their interest. Very interesting. Professor Lee, do you want to add anything more on Professor um, Yu's? Only view? to emphasize a very simple point that it's very tempting, and of course this is the way U.S. and other media, including South Korean, portray North Korea as illogical, irrational, mad, crazy. But my only point would be put yourself in their shoes. What do they have? They have nothing. Economy is in tatters. Agriculture hardly feeds its population. They have no industries to speak of. They have no soft power. Their effort to create movie industry failed. So they literally have nothing. The only time people pay them any respect, if you will, is when they launch nuclear missiles. And Unfortunately, it's simply the case that uh, they have learned a lesson, as Professor Yu mentioned. The only thing that ever seems to work to get China's attention, American attention, Japanese respect, is when they show they are capable of nuclear power and launching nuclear missiles. Mm -hmm. So, what would you do? Yeah. So, how are you going to solve a problem like North Korea? <laughs> I think that's going to be the following kind of questions out there. Yeah. It's not Maria, it's North Korea here. Okay, um, what kind of, probably not exactly a solutions, or but a kind of suggestion that you can probably make, Professor Pugh? Absolutely, and let me begin by, by underlining the problem as pointed out beautifully by, by Professors Yu and, and Lee. Um, indeed, I think one of the clear lessons that the world learned after George W. Bush was ironically, we mentioned before how policies often have their, poorly done policies have their ironic response leading to precisely what one wanted to avoid. The claim of George W. Bush, of course, is if the U.S. invades Iraq, that will send a message that no one can, can develop weapons of mass destruction without horrible consequences. And of course, the lesson was the precise opposite, that Saddam Hussein's mistake was not developing weapons of mass destruction, and not surprisingly, both Iran and North Korea have radically propelled their, their nuclear development immediately in the aftermath of that invasion. So I, I think this is indeed a, a, a something that we should have even been able to predict. And it's a good, I think, point to make in answering your question because clearly the policies that particularly the U.S. has been following are leading to the precise opposite response than we were hoping. Mm -hmm. And so, needless to say, that's not been very effective, to put it mildly. And so, precisely, the concern should be the opposite. The concern, indeed, should be to start building connections with North Korea. I don't mean to apply this as an easy thing, but to start building connections with North Korea that will provide other avenues than simply the nuclear option, which at the moment is, as Professor Lee mentioned, their really only remaining option. And so we need to give them more options. We need to build in integration. We need to build in levels of connection with North Korea, with the rest of East Asia, that will give other options to North Korea. And hopefully by doing so, we will allow other voices that I have no doubt exist in that government to play a more significant role and move toward a different type of policy that, again, I think we, coming from, from the U.S., need to be honest, that we have in part helped to create by our very dangerous actions in the world. Thank you. Well, Professor Lee, do you have any other solutions? Um, <laughs> no, I'm actually somewhat pessimistic on this point uh, for a slightly different reason than one might expect, which is the role of China, once again. I believe that the fundamental prop for North Korea, of course they get support from ethnic Koreans in Japan and so on, but the fundamental support North Korea gets is from China. Of course, China is frustrated with North Korea, 
but there is a way in which China does not want to see North Korea fail. And that is because once unification happens, you have a situation in which US GIs are right at Yalu and Tumen. Furthermore, there is, as I mentioned before, uh, one of the persistent worries of Chinese leadership, in my opinion, is that they're ruling over a fraying, fragile empire. That is to say, it's kind of a domestic domino theory in which if one minority secedes or engages in irredentism, everyone else will. So for example, one of the things that would happen is precisely that not only will Korea, unified Korea, be up to Yalu and Duman, but it's just over the river are million and a half, two million ethnic Koreans, many of whom they fear will engage in irredentist activities. And should that happen, Tibet, Xinjiang, Yunnan, Mongolia, all these could potentially fall. So for that precise reason, again, the primacy of domestic politics, in this case, worry about territorial integrity of China, that I just don't believe that China will ever let Korea unify, at least in the near run. Professor Yu. Well, because of the rise of China, I think there is a loss of consideration that we have to have, like the way to denuclearize you know, North Korea. But I, I think one of the ways is like the six-party talks. Um, what are the prospects of the six-party talks that you currently think, especially in solving or at least denuclearizing North Korea? Yeah. So uh, I think six-party talks is the only forum uh, that could potentially achieve the nuclearization of North Korea and the broader Korean Peninsula. But now it's really difficult. So actually, uh, there is a chance to uh, solve North Korea's nuclear issue. Uh, so the first nuclear crisis was resolved by uh, Jimmy Carter's visit to Pyongyang in 1994, uh, his meeting with uh, Kim Il-sung, so which brought about uh, agreed framework between the United States and uh, North Korea, which is basically North Korea will give up nuclear program, and the United States will guarantee security for North Korea and uh, establish economic and uh, diplomatic relations with North Korea. Uh, that agreed framework was abandoned by George Bush administration. And then the price of abandoning the agreed framework was uh, allowing North Korea to develop nuclear weapons. So second nuclear crisis was uh, uh, dealt with uh, six-party talks and uh, September 19th agreement of 2005 was basically a repetition of agreed framework. Uh, but now, after the North Korea obtaining nuclear weapon, it's much more difficult mm. to abandon nuclear weapon than to give up developing nuclear weapon before they have it. But the problem is that the United States uh, is not prepared to pay the price for denuclearization. Mm. Uh, so uh, it's not clear, but uh, North Korea sometimes say they are committed to denuclearization. Denuclearization is the will of late Kim Il-sung. Mm. When they he referred to Kim Il-sung's will, that refers to denuclearization of a Korean peninsula, which uh, means not just denuclearization of North Korea, but uh, removal of a nuclear umbrella for South Korea, as well as, I think, uh, the perfect guarantee of uh, peace uh, and uh, uh, normalization of relations, all those kind of things. But now, uh, it's like a prisoner's dilemma. And uh, whether the United States and other South Korea are willing to give North Korea uh, all the guarantee before North Korea denuclearize, whether North Korea will denuclearize before obtaining complete guarantee, not just from the current U.S. administration, but for, from future U.S. administrations. That kind of lack of trust is a great obstacle to the denuclearization. But the problem is that 
with that six-party talks, is there any alternative option? It is clear right, yeah. there is no military option. So uh, Clinton administration during the first nuclear crisis in 1994 considered surgical strike to Yongbyon facility. But the conclusion is, uh, oh, the United States, South Korea cannot afford to do such kind of risk, risky attack. So the current uh, the U.S. strategy of strategic patience is actually doing nothing, just allowing North Korea to continue to develop nuclear weapons. So uh, how to engage North Korea again? I think, uh, and just wishful thinking, continuing wishful thinking uh, for China to exert some uh, uh, pressure to North Korea not to uh, develop the nuclear weapons. That has not worked so far. It is not likely to work in the future. So I think there is some more flexible thinking is required for the United States and South Korea. Okay, thank you very much. Well, is there any, well in that case, is there any hope for Korean unification? Am I going too far? <laughs> um, why, did <laughs> first, uh, why did I first start with Professor Lee? Is, oh. is there, is there any plausible kind of scenarios for well, Korean unification? Um, no, as I mentioned, I think I'm very pessimistic because ultimately I think China will block it. So China is willing to prop up North Korean regime as long as plausible. I mean, it is possible that over time, if North Korea should kind of pursue the North Korean equivalent of post deng economic reform, that over a decade, two decades, there will be enough social ferment that there will be a movement towards something like unification. But I suspect that it's very unlikely because, again, it's certainly not in the interest of North Korean Communist Party, People's you know, Party elite to seize power. And it's not, in my reading at least, in China's interest to let Korea unify. Mm -hmm. Professor Peart, are you also pessimistic? Uh, I am. I, I mean, I can imagine. Is there any optimistic person? <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I mean, the only scenario that I think could play out in the nearby future for Korean unification would not be an optimistic one. It would be a, a yes, full collapse right. of the North Korean state, which would hardly be an optimistic scenario for anyone involved. Um, that could conceivably, in terms of the scenarios we can imagine playing out, lead to a unification, but again, in ways that would be just horrific for almost everyone involved. Um, minus something like that, I too think we're looking at a very, very long-term situation. And I think in terms of issues of foreign policy and dealing with North Korea, we should assume that that's not likely to happen anytime soon. Again, certainly a collapse which no one would want to occur. And therefore, we should, on the contrary, work in toward developing kinds of integration that would allow for, ultimately, a more peaceful set of relations that down the road could open the road for other things. And indeed, I very much agree with Professor Yu as well. A, a huge, huge player in this is the United States of America. And we need to be honest, our policies have been horrific in dealing with North Korea. And we are significantly responsible for what is now playing out. And, the U.S. has got to change its policies to create a more reasonable <laughs> world now within the Korean Peninsula to bring North Korea into these larger relations. And then over the long run, who knows? But in the short run, no, I do not think Korean integration is likely in the immediate future. Hmm. Professor Yu, um, you know what my question is going to be, optimistic or pessimistic? Well, <laughs> I really want to ask something more on that question. Um, what kind of role should South Korea play in the overall Korean unification? Well, we're lots of time talking about relying on to China, relying on to U.S. U.S. should do this, China should do that. What does South Korea have to do to bring kind I, of future unification? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, what kind of uni unification do you consider? Mm -hmm. uh, actually, that... Uh, defines what approach you will take. Uh, my personal idea is it's more important to manage long-term peaceful coexistence, coexistence between the two Koreas rather than pursuing uh, to a uh, uh, hasty uh, reunification. So uh, 
in, uh, in the last few decades in Korea, we've seen sometimes more leftist, uh, more radical thinking about reunification. Uh, we o we've also seen more rightist uh, uh, approach, unification by absorption. Uh, I both the approach uh, seems to, uh, seem to me uh, risky, risky, mm. uh, which could uh, produce a lot of uh, prob problems uh, rather than, uh, and uh, also uh, recently I see many conservatives uh, think in mind uh, German style of unification by absorption. Uh, I think it's not completely impossible. Yeah. Uh, it could happen, uh, given the frailty of North Korean regime. But I don't think it's a reasonable policy for South Korean government to pursue mm -hmm. unification by absorption. So in German case, the West Germany did not pursue unification by absorption. Mm -hmm. They pursued coexistence. They helped East Germany. The result was unification by absorption, by the choice of a German population. Uh, if a South Korean government pursues unification by absorption, I think it will create even more backlash. More, uh, it will create more difficulty toward the North Korean regime, toward the China, so it, and without any effective solution. Also, that will create an enormous uh, problem rather than, yeah, 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 not just the cost of unification. And uh, so uh, more also is, yeah, so uh, since the early 1990s, many people in South Korea and the outside world predicted the imminent collapse of North Korean regime. But North Korea showed its resilience. And China doesn't want the North Korean regime to collapse. So, uh, I think more reasonably, we need to pursue peaceful coexistence and uh, mutual exchange. Uh, only with that, over time, some conditions for unification might develop. So it'll take quite a long time. Yeah, right? yeah. We have to be we patient. We need to have a long-term perspective. Okay, um, that, was, that was a wonderful dialogue. Now, uh, it is time for us to open our dialogue up to our floor. If you have any comments or questions on the dialogue or on the topics that we discussed so far, please feel free to raise your hand. Okay, uh, Mr. Williams. Uh, I wanted to ask the panel, which I thought uh, did an excellent job, incidentally, uh, but about the long-term political stability of China. Most analysts would argue that because of the tremendous economic development, uh, the people have been relatively happy and stability is, uh, looks good in the future. Now, my friends and financial uh, analysts say the banking system is very weak and the whole thing could come crashing down any day. Uh, and I'm not an analyst in the financial world, but uh, I hear that from my colleagues in the business school. I wonder if you would have a, an opinion on that. Okay, well... Um Okay, I think it's now it's time for us to wrap up our dialogue at here today. Um, today's talk has given us diverse insight to the major changes that countries in Northeast Asia are currently facing. We hope that a better understanding of these changes and challenges help in building a sustainable peace and a deeper cooperation among Korea, China, and Japan. I would like to express my sincere gratitude to our participants, Professor Puet, Professor Lee, and Professor Yu. Why don't we give a big hand to them first? <laughs> and thank you all for joining us our today's dialogue here today. Now, um, see you next year, and until then, take care. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>
Thanks for all the professors here. And I'd like to give a question to Professor Pewitt uh, about the uh, North, Korea, North Korea focusing on nuclear bombs. Yes. Uh, you gave a solution of uh, providing North Korea more options. And I would like to give a question if what this option would be. Yes. And specifically uh, about that option, uh, specifically uh, how are we going to give that option and which extent would that option would be? Yes. Thank you. Okay, first, could he answer first and then have more questions? Absolutely. I think the questions was for Professor Pierre. Yeah. Absolutely, it's a wonderful question. And what I would recommend is several fold. Um, to begin with, going back to Professor Yu's earlier excellent point, I would say the goal should be peaceful coexistence. So to try to calm down as much as possible the very dangerous situation that's developed um, that will take a lot of work on the part of the South Korean government to work with the U.S. government, which again I think has been part of the, the author of the very dangerous situation that we found ourselves in. Um, the other set of things to do would be to involve um, all sorts of other types of integration. Um, the most obvious type should certainly be pursued um, to continue to open up trade, which is clearly crucial, to continue to open up links between the two countries. Um, I think t continuations to lead to more openings at the cultural level is crucial. This is something that Professor Lee has done a huge amount of work on, and it's absolutely crucial. We tend to overlook these things, but the development of cultural links can play a crucial role. And the more this can be done, the more these trade networks can be built, the more cultural links can be built, the more diplomatic links can be built, while having a calming down of the diplomatic situation, what you begin to move toward is a normalization of relations between these two. Um, part of the sense would be this is not intended to be, would not be perceived to be, crucially, some kind of drive on the part of the South Korean government to incorporate North Korea. It would rather be an opening up of relationships between two countries, building more toward a peaceful coexistence, building links that would help to ease the kind of tremendous tensions that have played out. And if these seem like absurdly minor um, sorts of things in terms of the, this dangerous situation we're talking about, I would actually say these seemingly minor things down the road could have an incredible impact. And all of this, of course, is going on. The key is simply to do it more and more while building this much more peaceful coexistence. And I think it's surprising how these little things can build a snowball effect that can grow and grow over time. So thank you. It's a wonderful question.